Welcome back to the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast. Alicia and Bob are back recording this episode, by the way, for the record, on May 9th, 2024. So if you found this podcast later in our real world timeline, there might now be other episodes in between this and the last episode we released, which was the Dawn of the Jedi overview. And just always making the notes, the content of this podcast was accurate and up to date when recorded, but that might change as more content is released. So we will issue update episodes from time to time to cover anything that's been added to or changed. Now, the quickie intro episode explains how all this works in more detail. And I do also recommend checking out the previous Dawn of the Jedi episode, the sort of overview recap of Era 1. So you have the basis of the founding of uh, Star Wars history and some key terms that we're going to be using in this episode and throughout this podcast. Not to mention a look at what we might see in the upcoming movie. Right, Bob? Oh, yes, indeed. I know that uh, there were some people um, who were listening to the podcast and didn't realize that there was the Dawn of the Jedi movie. So that's going to brighten your day. I'd say it will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back, Jedi Jedi Bob. Thank you for being with us again. Um, you've been rather busy on your own YouTube channel. What are you up to over there now? Oh, I am playing more than one video game. I'm reviewing Quite a few Star Wars action figures. Uh, I'm behind on my reviews of the Bad Batch animated series from Star Wars, but uh, I'm really trying to crank those out as well. And uh, <laughs> quite a lot, actually. And the X-Men 97 episodes you've been reviewing most, recently? Most definitely X-Men 97. Yes, that too. Yeah. Yeah, that's been a really good show. So uh, Star Wars fans, you have Disney Plus. X-Men 97 is worth a watch. <laughs> So this episode, we will be diving into the second era of Star Wars history, the Old Republic. So we're picking up where we left off. And in this episode, we're going to cover the 24,000 years of history of the Old Republic from about 25,000 BBY before the Battle of Yavin. Again, that means uh, before the original movie until about the Old Republic era ends at around 1000 BBY. Bob, you called this your favorite era of the moment. What are you most looking forward to talking about? Um, I think uh, mostly uh, my enjoyment has to do with more than one aspect of the force and uh, and those who practice uh, those aspects mm. of it. I mean, but there are so many battles and and things like that 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 are coming up that I mean, I enjoy hearing about as well as talking about. So quite a, quite a bit, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's I mean, it's quite a, a packed era in in time. I mean, sorry, in Legends history. But actually, I was surprised going through this, how much has been confirmed in canon now. Like, I know you were excited about to see some characters that have been referenced now in canon. Yes, um, I read of quite a few back in my salad days. And one was Ula Keldroma and uh, another was right. Sunrider. So... I mean, they're they're canon. We don't know much about them in in the new timeline yet, but they are, uh, I do believe, mentioned in what's called the Keldroma epics, and not much is uh, mentioned outside of that. We just know that there are Keldroma epics. But I got really excited uh, when coming across their names, and I think they're actually featured uh, in an art book from the. Clone Wars Season 2, uh, I actually have the DVD, and me and art books don't really get along that well because I can't see them, but I found out a couple weeks ago that they are in that particular art book, and they were going to be featured in the Jedi Temple during a specific scene during Season 2, um, but uh, that scene was cut. But still, when I heard about them, I was like, oh, wow, that is, that is very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's how a lot of things are being brought into canon now is that um, they are just someone in a reference book was like, well, this is something I love from Legends. So I'll just add it in the reference book as, you know, canon and nobody at Star Wars tells them they can't. So here we go. And then uh, hopefully all of this again, as we keep saying, will be fleshed out as we get more canon content uh, on this point in the timeline. Yes. 
Uh, yes. Uh, like last time, the way we're going to do this episode, this episode is going to also have a lot of legends again. Um, so like Era One, we'll first talk about what has been confirmed in canon, and then we'll spend more time talking about some key figures and things uh, such from legends that we think might be pulled into canon or that you should just know to keep up with the biggest Star Wars nerds. And I stay that, say that affectionately as a Star Wars nerd myself. Uh, a lot of this also comes from random reference books uh, and like role-playing games like Force and Destiny is a tabletop role-playing game, which are considered canon, but they might be retconned later. So of course, we'll let you know in any update episodes if and when that happens. But what is confirmed in canon now? Uh, well, first of all, I want to start with the uh, every age has a circular emblem. And the circular emblem of the Old Republic era is the Jedi emblem. So it's a simplified, stylized pattern of curved shapes that suggests a bird spreading its wings to leap into the air and take flight. And the bird has a star for its head on the end of a long neck. So elegant, uh, you know, supposed to be st strong but elegant sort of figure. Um but it's interesting, though, that the powers that be are dubbing this era of the timeline kind of synonymous with the Jedi. Mm -hmm. You think that's fair, Bob? I think so. And I really like the way you described that image. Um, yeah, when it comes to the visual aspects of the, uh, the different emblems, there's not much to go on. So, uh, yeah, Star Wars people, let Alicia do the uh, the alt text. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, they, they don't. And it's also these emblems are rather new because it's it's fairly recent that they defined, OK, these are the nine eras that we're dividing content into. And um, these are the emblems. And most of the emblems are pulled from, you know, they are shown somewhere else in the stories along the way. But I think it's very telling what they chose to be the image to represent the entire era. So, yeah, we did talk a bit about the ideology of the Jedi in our Dawn of the Jedi overview, but not so much about their relationship with the Force. We talked about something called midichlorians, and um, basically the Jedi, they're high M counts. They have these midichlorians in their blood that allow them to make an easier connection with the Force around them and, and use that Force to do things like move objects with their willpower, uh, telekinesis, basically, um, which also they can use on themselves so that they can do massive force jumps, which are fun in video games. Um, they also have commonly some mind influencing powers, particularly on weaker minds. And, yeah. and yeah, well, that's, you don't, I always, do you think, do you think that uh, they would be able to Jedi mind trick you, Bob? I hope not. <laughs> I like to think <laughs> my mind is pretty sound. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope not, too, but it's, that's one of those things. It's like it would be, I think, more of us than we're comfortable with would false, sus become susceptible to the Jedi mind tricks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they also have an overall heightened awareness of their surroundings and some have special force abilities. Uh, this was even more prevalent in Legends, but these characters are showing up more in canon again. I have the feeling Canon seems a, a little less afraid to get weird these days. Do you think that's the Clone Wars effect? I really you do. Think? Um, I feel like it started around some point in the Clone Wars. And then, you know, once we started getting into a lot of the uh, the Disney Plus shows, which I won't get into here, but yeah, you, you yeah. Should really start delving into aspects of the Force that you, you might recognize from uh, from the other timeline. Yeah, exactly. I like that. You know, it doesn't have to be we're going to talk a lot about the Jedi and the Sith today in every episode of this podcast, but it's nice to have more variety. And, and also just, you know, let's this is a fantasy. Let's just go full in with the mysticism. And Dave Filoni, who's basically like the, the heir to the Star Wars empire, um, basically George Lucas is handing him the keys. Um, he's, I guess he's proven himself to the executives and they're allowing him to get a little more goofy. It feels like. Yeah, I think so too. Um, it would be amazing to just, uh, sit and listen to what he had to say about some of this stuff. I mean, we have gotten into some of it, you know, if you've watched him in interviews and other things, uh, but he just knows so much and just, an, it's amazing to be uh, a fly on that wall, so to speak, when it comes to listening to what he has to say. 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes I get annoyed with him retconning certain beloved books, but <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not even talking about legends, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I mean, it's nice to have somebody. It's more than nice. It's essential to have somebody at the helm who's as passionate about it the world as he is about star wars so that's yeah that's a good thing where we are blessed to have that um do you think anyone in this universe can learn to wield the force it seems to be more and more implied these days doesn't it um it kind of feels like that might be where they're headed uh it might be thrice as difficult for some people some people may you know, start down that path and think, you know, I'm going to go do something else. But then again, some people might continue down that path. I don't know. It's I, I think it has a lot to do with that uh, with that M count. But I mean, that doesn't mean, I yeah. guess, these days that you can't. So I think of it as like like flexibility, for instance, uh, some mm -hmm. people naturally have more flexibility and it's easier to do a split. But just because it doesn't come naturally to you to do that doesn't mean you can't work at it. And it's going to be harder and more painful for you, but you can ultimately achieve the same result. Do you get that similar feeling? Right. I, uh, I always think of me learning how to uh, operate a video camera. You know, it was mm. three times as difficult for me in the beginning, uh, right. you know, with a lot of a lot of trial and a heck of a lot of error. But um, I mean, I think if you do a thing often enough, uh, you you can get a bit better at it, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I think that an analogy with vision is a is a good one because it's not like um, it's just you you learn to do things differently. I guess if you mm -hmm. don't have that sight of of the force. There you yeah. go. Uh, well, we're going to talk about non-Jedi Force users more toward the end of this episode, but uh, and we're also going to talk about people who are low in the in the Force and and but still interested in Force stuff and what happens with them. Uh, but I'm not considering the Sith non-Jedi Force users at the moment, or at least for this era, because they're actually a splinter faction of the Jedi. And the tale of the Old Republic is centered around a millennia-long civil war between these two factions. We ended last episode's canon timeline talk with the formation of the Galactic Republic, uh, which, yeah, this era will later be called the Old Republic, um, from the perspective of characters who live in, say, Year Zero. But of course, now they live in it. They call it the Galactic Republic. And this republic is closely linked with the Jedi Order from the beginning, uh, because the Jedi are basically protectors of the realm. They're basically Force Knights. Would you agree? Do you think that's a good way to put it, Bob? I think that's a great way to put it, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how they do the designs for the Old Republic, because uh, in the new canon in the High Republic, which we'll be talking about uh, next week, the designs, they are looking more like white shining knights chivalric um so i'm very curious how they'll work that even back more and what they'll look like in the old republic when we see that uh the canon version on screen Ooh. yeah asbro has seriously got to get on the ball when it comes to tactile representations of those costumes because i'm like <laughs> i really want to see those <laughs> yeah i mean i think honestly the biggest difference is color. Like, we'll, we'll discuss this in the High Republic, but in the High Republic, it's a lot of white and gold coloring. Whereas wow. later in the timeline, there's a lot of like brown coloring, like monks. And right. you, you get the feeling it's probably rougher fabrics later and things like that. And so when we see the trailers for the Acolytes, what they're wearing then, and that takes place at the end of the High Republic. So they are having kind of like the white outfits covered with brown robes so it's sort of like this transitional period in terms of jedi fashion it's interesting to extrapolate backwards what would it look like now but mm -hmm. uh, yeah so the old republic is in a period of expansion into the outer rim and um there comes a period known as the hundred years of darkness which in canon is around 5000 bby so this is about 
2,000 years after similar events happen in Legends. But in canon, a rogue Jedi whose name has been quote-unquote lost to history, I'll just tell you his name is Ajunta Paul in Legends. We don't, could be someone completely different in canon. But this rogue Jedi broke away from the Order, and he and his followers, they believed that to achieve their full strength, the Jedi needed to explore the dark side of the Force. So... The Force is divided, as we talked about, into the Ashla Bogan, light and dark. And of course, there's the Bendu uh, balance aspect, too. But those who use the light side of the Force, they tend to um, use it through kind of more passive channeling. Like they're sort of tapping into what nature provides. And those who use the dark side of the Force are more conquering the Force and twisting it to their will. Like they don't accept what nature says is possible. They want to do quote unquote unnatural things. Yeah. Uh, one thing I remember George mentioning when it comes to light uh, versus dark, I, I believe he said the light side has a lot to do with, uh, with focusing on others, focusing on selfless acts. Whereas I think the dark side, you tend to uh, cling to the things that, uh, that you want to happen. It's more, you know, being attached to um, the outcome you want to see. Uh, you know, right. it, I think it tends to focus more on selfishness when it comes to the dark side. So, yeah. Right. A lot of the great Sith villains don't think that they're being selfish or they convince they have a story, yeah. you know, they tell themselves. They're like, but I'm doing it for the greater good. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing when we get to see inside their heads, as it were, and see why they're doing the things that they're doing. Because, of course, they feel like their motives are uh, pure and they are the heroes in their own story. A lot of them. Yeah. That's how they perceive themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I think Star Wars does some of its best storytelling, just showing these different perspectives. And um, this is why I, I love especially... As we get into more modern storytelling, I think outside Star Wars, you're seeing it more and more, too. But just this sort of the idea of gray morality, you mm -hmm. know, the um, that it's none of us are perfect or perfectly good or perfectly corrupt. We are some combination somewhere on the spectrum. Right. But uh, yes, these uh, Sith teachings are, were considered, they actually came from um, a an alien species called the Sith. So they were a species of red-skinned humanoids with face tentacles. And these have, have now been confirmed in canon as well. Um, and they were mostly killed out a while ago, but it's their teachings that this rogue Jedi studied. And um, these are forbidden, considered dangerous. So he was exiled, but his following grew. And we have to pause here because we haven't introduced an important concept. What are your thoughts on the Jedi High Council? Well, I, I think the, the High Council tends to, I feel, be often cordoned off from uh, a lot of matters. I mean, they, they, to me, they feel kind of um, like islands unto themselves sometimes. Um, right. Yeah, we see them um, when we see them on screen, we see them sit or on the page. We see them mm -hmm. sitting in a sort of circular room with windows looking out high over the top of Coruscant, just really kind of emphasizing that they're an echo chamber of their own ideas and right. just disconnected from the people who actually live ben beneath them, literally. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But I think that uh, that does get worse in certain areas than other areas. Um, do you do you blame them for exiling this rogue Jedi or do you think they should have handled it differently? I, I feel like uh, everyone was in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, as a fan. It's just kind of like watching a an intergalactic train wreck, as it were. Um, it's it's amazing to to witness how it all uh, shook out. Well, just in terms of, of what I can read about online when it comes to articles, uh, I can't wait to actually get into how that might have happened uh, at some point in time. Do you think that the rogue Jedi was right in wanting to also study the, the Sith teachings? 
I, I feel like I would need to, at least in the new timeline, get into what drove him to do it. Right. Um, okay. So, I, so yeah. it's not an absolute. It's a personal. It depends. I think so. Okay, that's fair. So, yeah, so he left and this led to the formation of the Sith with his followers and the start. Uh, and this is yeah, amidst or at the start of the hundred years of darkness. Um, so for context, this split happens about 20,000 years after the Jedi Order formed. So for 20,000 years, they were one solid order. And now this is about 5,000 years before the original movie. So... They spent more time being a single order than they spent being Jedi versus Sith. Um, and yeah, for some legends context, this all happens before Knights of the Old Republic, um, before those games, which are in legends set around 5000 BBY. Uh, it's, it does make me wonder if uh, there's a lot of speculation about whether they'll bring Knights of the Old Republic into canon. And if they do... Might they change up that timeline to make this uh, align more? Might Knights of the Old Republic take place slightly later in the timeline? Mm -hmm. We'll see. So the home world of the Sith Order was originally Korriban, which is later called Moribant. And this is a world in the Outer Rim that uh, gets so ravaged by endless war that eventually they abandon it. But it still remains a sacred place for the Sith and a burial place for their Sith Masters until Darth Bane. And we're going to come back to him in a bit because he's an important figure in both canon and legends. Um, but he's the last Sith buried on Korriban or Moribant that we know of, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and of course, I have to point out also the uh, hyperdrives are invented around the same time, which adds extra fuel to the Civil War. And... Um, Leads to the great Sith Wars and the Sith make massive super weapons powered by those kyber crystals we talked about in the Dawn of the Jedi overview and great battles like the Scourge of Malachor, which may sound familiar to fans of the Rebels series and or Darth Maul comics. So we'll definitely be talking about that more later in the timeline. But Bob, you said that the Sith are perhaps your favorite group culturally in, uh, in Star Wars. What makes them so interesting to you? I think it's all of those uh, unnatural abilities that we get to hear about as well as witness in uh, the new timeline as, as well as the other. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the links that they go to in order to cling to their own mortality. Um, the things that they do, the things that they sacrifice in order to uh, somehow cling to this mortal coil. And it definitely winds up taking its toll, um, depending on the character that you uh, that you're getting into at, at a particular point in time. So, um, yeah, I, I think they, they have serious uh, horror movie vibes to them. They're True. <laughs> a lot of them are creepy characters. Uh, some of them have uh, become disfigured because of their choices. And uh, it's interesting to follow. Uh, Great examples as to, you know, how not to uh, go down certain paths. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's something you and I haven't mentioned on this podcast yet. We're both massive horror fans, so yes. that might explain some things. <laughs> and um, Korriban is a fascinating uh, planet for me. Uh, I first heard about it in Dark Lords of the Sith. Uh, it's, it's a story from Legends and the way that it was described uh I remember it sending chills down my spine at around age 14 or so. Just such an interesting graveyard of a world. I, yeah. I've always imagined miles and miles of tombs. And uh, I'm not really sure what the environment actually looks like visually. But uh, that's a fascinating planet to explore. Wouldn't recommend it doing after dark, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it always after dark on Corbin? <laughs> yeah, um, maybe. <laughs> Um, actually, we will be visiting this planet later in the timeline, so we w will uh, all get a chance to, quote unquote, look at it together. So looking forward to that. We're going to pause our discussion of the Sith here for a moment, though, because there's another important, mostly non-force using faction that emerges during this era, and that is 
Mandalorians. Cue, <laughs> in my head, I hear the Mandalorian theme song. <laughs> yeah, this is This is thousands of years before the television show called The Mandalorian is set. Um, they are an old civilization. It emerged a little under 10,000 BBY on the planet of Mandalore in the Outer Rim, and they are a clan-based culture of a variety of species with different clans following different dogmas, but they are, in general, very dogmatic. They are honor-bound warriors known for their Beskar armor, and so Beskar is a type of metal that comes from the planet of Mandalore and is kind of the source of a lot of their power, wealth and power, because it's very... It, Marvel fans, this is basically like the vibranium of the Star Wars world. Um, it's one of the only metals you can use to fight a lightsaber that won't just like melt under a lightsaber's blade. And they, Mandalorians are also, you might, if you've heard anything about them, you probably know them for their distinctive helmets, which are inspired by medieval knights and their jetpacks which are just inspired by coolness and yeah. convenience of flight. <laughs> are you a fan of the Mandalorians, Bob? Oh, ever since I got my first Boba Fett action figure in 1997 or thereabouts. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We're going to be talking lots about Boba Fett when we get to starting with, yeah, when we get to Era 4. Uh, so the Mandalorians are conquerors, which led to a war with the Jedi and a whole sector of space being named after them. And uh, the most important figure in Mandalorian history is Mandalore the Great. And so after this, everyone was called Mandalore with an apostrophe in the middle, um, because that's how you know it's ancient Star Wars. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> He he apparently rode the giant beast called the Mythosaur, which is thought extinct in later eras. And his bat his battles against the Jedi are still remembered in song. And basically he led like the conquest of the planet of Mandalore. But the Jedi and the Mandalorians, they fought each other in wars that went on centuries, but they weren't always enemies. Around 1050 BBY, a Mandalorian named Tar Vizsla was inducted into the Jedi Order, and he made a lightsaber with a short sword-shaped blade called the Darksaber. And don't worry, you're going to see plenty of this saber for yourself later, and even more Mandalorians to go with it. But the Jedi kept the Darksaber when Tar Vizsla died, uh, but his clan sacked the Jedi Temple on the capital city planet of Coruscant to get it back. And the Darksaber was thereafter passed down through Clan Vizsla, uh, father to son, daughter to mother, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but and this is a great example, by the way, of non-force users wielding a lightsaber of sorts. Bob, do you have a favorite lightsaber? My goodness. Um, I do enjoy a very familiar double edged lightsaber that we'll be getting into uh, at some point on the timeline, which is actually mm -hmm. uh, also, I think, taken from uh, a bit of Legends continuity. George saw yep. something he liked in Legends and was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to have one of my characters wield, uh, wield this. But uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. But I love the, uh, the sound of the dark saber. Uh, which is another, uh, I think, all-time favorite of mine. When uh, I found out we were going to learn quite a bit about it during uh, during the Clone Wars, which I think that's when we first actually saw it. Still remember right. the first trailer we we saw it in, and it was. I, I just loved the sound of it. I didn't know what it looked like, of course, because back yeah. then, I mean, there wasn't much audio description or any at all in in terms of certain Star Wars projects. But uh, yeah, I love the dark saber just as much as the uh, very familiar double-edged saber. Oh, nice. Um, I guess I didn't necessarily realize that it had a different sound. But yeah, that makes sense because it's a different shape, um, which I don't know. You know, lightsabers basically are magic anyway. It's all space magic in this IP. But, yes. but uh, <laughs> I don't know how you get a laser to form a sword shape, but I am here for it. <laughs> Me too. But as for the Mandalorians, uh, it, within the Old Republic era, there are wars end, for now, with a cataclysm that scorches their planet, um, turning it into an uninhabitable desert. So they have to build cities and domes. And 
and also some live on the other planets that they've collected. And we don't hear much from that sector for some centuries. As far as we know at this point anyway, that might change. Um, I also have to mention another catastrophe of this era. A lovely forested planet by the name of Mustafar becomes a pawn in a magic-powered interpersonal drama and gets pushed out of its orbit, after which it transforms into the lava planet fans know it for in later stories. So we're, we'll get this full backstory when we talk about the VR game called Vader Immortal and the Vader series of comics, which is set in era five. I may not be able to play that game, but I have watched those cutscenes at least twice. I think it's one of my favorites in terms of lore and what we learn pertaining to Mustafar. Awesome. I, yeah. I'm excited to talk about it because it's a fun one. Um, I do have a PlayStation VR and I have a background in uh, gaming work myself, uh, also VR. And I love that is one of my favorite VR games just because of the I'm excited to talk about it. Just they they make smart decisions about the VR-ness of it. And also it's yeah, it's a nice story that fills out Vader's perspective in that part of the timeline. And the Vader comics are also quite good, too. Oh, yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get all into that. But yeah, that's uh, another like few eras from now. <laughs> right. But what we know for now is this is how Mustafar is formed, which was news to me when I first uh, experienced that. Me too. And meanwhile, another culture is growing in isolation in the nearly unnavigable, unknown regions of space, which we talked about in Dawn of the Jedi Overview. Um, so we mentioned this group already, the Chiss. And these are the people of a blue humanoid character with red eyes we'll meet later named Thrawn. And the, the Chiss, they're carving out, Thrawn is not alive yet at this point, but the Chiss are carving out their own region of space called the Chiss Ascendancy. Um, basically, in 5100 BBY, the Chiss great families unite under one ruling family called the Stibla, and uh, so they become the first ruling family. And there's a lot of drama that goes on in this sort of isolated, unknown regions, but the rest of the galaxy won't hear from them for millennia because they're sort of cut off from the main part of the galaxy. But we'll get into what all they're up to during this time when we talk about the Thrawn books, which are also mostly set in the Fifth Era. And around 5000 BBY, a great temple is constructed on a jungle-covered moon known as Yavin 4. 5,000 years later, on this moon, a battle will occur from which everything else will be dated. So the Battle of Yavin takes place on a um, moon that's just being turned into a temple in 5,000 BBY. Around 4,000 BBY, a dark lord of the Sith named Exar Kun invents the double-bladed lightsaber that Bob was excited about. So <laughs> this is confirmed in canon now. <laughs> and the entire galaxy gets a little bit cooler. <laughs> yeah. And also during this era, one of the many worlds settled by humans is a world called Naboo. And it's one of the nicest climates of, out of any Star Wars planets. It looks like a lovely place to live, but it happens to be occupied by a native species called the Gungans, which are like an amphibian species. You might have heard of Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks is a Gungan. Uh, we'll definitely be seeing them for ourselves and their underwater cities because this is an important setting in at the end of the next era, just after the time of the Acolyte. So... I don't know, kind of hypocritical for the Jedi to be mad at the mad at the Mandalorians, but not the humans on Naboo for their colonial practices. What do you think? I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Hi hypocrisy is something that the Jedi might be called out on once or twice in the course of their history. Mm hmm. And um, of course, we have to mention the warrior Wookiees are they this is a popular Jedi like species. They're. They're doing their own thing on Kashyyyk. They're kind of jungle-like planet during this time. Uh, can you do a Wookiee impression? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been trying. Okay, here, I'm going to try. It's... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not great. And I have to say, my cats always run out of the room when I try. <laughs> but, I feel like uh, I when I do it, yeah? I feel like when I do it, I sound like the cowardly lion from Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like someone it. drowning... <laughs> <laughs> that's all i got 
<laughs> Gotta trill the tongue, trill the tongue. <laughs> I can't <But>, trill. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I had to learn how to trill my tongue because I took voice lessons for a long time. And so I had to like start with going da 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 <laughs> and had to learn to <laughs> Anyway. If you can do a better Wookiee impression than us, which is pretty much guaranteed, then yes. we, we'd love to hear it. Please email yours to swtimelinepodcast at gmail.com. And later I'm going to put together a compilation of Wookiee impressions shared with us. Um, and that, that link's in the, in the notes as well. And obviously I have to point out, we are using everyone in the Star Wars world uses as their main reference Wikipedia which is obviously a play on Wikipedia. And now you know where the Wookiee part comes from. So if you're looking up Wikipedia, that's how it's spelled. Um, I, I just another group I want to mention quickly confirmed in canon are the Amoxine Warriors. It's I just find them interesting because they left the galaxy around this time after being defeated by the Old Republic. And they're mentioned in books from both the High Republic and Era 7. So... The fact they're re mentioning them in recent books makes me wonder if we're going to see or learn more of, about them. I feel like they're cooking something up with them. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just mentioning now that if you hear a Moxine Warriors, you know that Alicia and Bob are doing Leo pointing meme at the screen. Um, finally, not to be confused with the Sith. I just feel like we need to mention that there is a species known as the Bith. <laughs> so... This is another species that turns up regularly and they sort of have an insectoid humanoid look with like folds down their face instead of cheeks. And yes, in Legends, there are Bith Sith, Yeah, so, which I hope they bring over into canon just because it's fun to say. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Now, as for the Sith, uh, picking back up with their story, they do at some point end up taking the capital planet of Coruscant and thus the galaxy. And for a time, they are in charge and they're sending their red lightsaber wielding dark seekers to hunt down threats. Um, this is called the Era of the Sith, and it's unclear when it begins, but it ends with the Jedi Sith War of 1032 BBY. So this war... Um, the Sith, which are also known as the Brotherhood of Darkness, they had a member who became known as Darth Bane. And Darth Bane is, is an important figure from Legends who's been confirmed. The most important things about him have been confirmed in canon, but it's yet to see if any elements of his full backstory change. We're not going to go into his full backstory now, but the parts that are confirmed in canon is that he saw weakness within the Brotherhood of Darkness. He saw infighting and greed. And um, by the way, a lot of this, if you want to learn more, comes from the Dr. Afra comics. So we're definitely going to be talking about them later in the timeline and more about this, the canon version of the story. But basically, there was a cult of the Ascendant who tried to replicate force technology, the, who tried to replicate the force using technology. They wanted to use it to destroy the Sith. And of course... We've got the Jedi who are clearly trying to destroy the Sith, even though the Sith started out as Jedi. And eventually the Sith do fall, but the Republic is falling too. So they, they reach an era of dark ages leading into this final war when the Jedi and the Republic work together to take the Sith out. That's what they think anyway. Now it's Darth Bane the Jedi actually, they destroy most of the Sith and they leave them intensely weakened. And then Darth Bane, he makes himself the sole Sith survivor by destroying the rest of the Sith. So he's basically, his idea is he's cleaning up shop. It's start over fresh and um, something called the rule of two. Now, the rule of two is super essential. We'll get into that. But I just wanted to point out a couple of cool things about Darth Bane from Legends. Are you a Darth Bane fan? Have you have you read those books, Bob? Oh, yes. I'm actually on. I think it's my fourth or fifth reread of the Darth Bane trilogy. I just started um, Dynasty of Evil. OK, I, I, I mean, I think um, I, I have I don't I haven't read that many Legends books, but this one. But the Darth Bane trilogy has got to be. Some of the coolest storytelling, I think, in Legends, personally, because there's stuff like, OK, so he has something called Orbalisk Armor, 
which is a suit comprised of these near invincible parasites um, that have a very hard shell. So they're able to deflect even lightsabers. Uh, but the parasites, they cling to the body uh, using thousands of tiny teeth and feed off the dark side of the force in the person. So it's just like painful armor to wear. And it you know, makes you almost in, impervious, but it also means you can't move around stealthily, um, but you are stronger and more agile. And yeah, so uh, it's pros and minuses, mostly minuses in my book. Would you wear Orbalisk on our, uh, armor? Oh, I don't know if I'd want to be in constant pain, so probably not. <laughs> yeah, the Sith are more fun to admire from a distance <laughs> rather than yeah. actually experience their existence <laughs> most definitely i also have to point out from from these books there's a planet called onderon which has a moon duxon if i'm saying that correctly and by the way this duxon is where these orbalisks are from but the cool thing about it is they are close enough the planet and the moon that they're mixing atmospheres and they have these creatures that migrate flying between them and i just have to point it out because i saw foundation do it in uh season two episode six called why the gods made wine and you know i just have to pull a star wars did it first moment there <laughs> there you go yeah because I'm pretty sure that that part's not like most of Foundation, the TV show, which I mostly enjoy. Um, most of it's not from the Foundation books, which I have not read much of. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the rule of two. How would you explain the rule of two, Bob? Well, to me, it's basically saying there can only be two Sith at one time, a master and an apprentice. Um, one to embody the power and one to crave it. Yeah, exactly. That's the, this is basically quoting Darth Bane there. That's pretty much exactly what he says. It's inspired by something called the doctrine of the dyad, which there's a force dyads that can form, which are unique and unbreakable force bonds between two force sensitive people. And basically Bane wanted to, he wanted to try to force the force into forming a dyad between a master and apprentice. And because he and the Sith cultists who came after him believed that this would unlock the full potential of the dark side of the force. But force said no. <laughs> time and time again, <laughs> different Sith lords have tried to create a dyad with their apprentice and the force is like, hmm, that's not quite how it works. But we will talk more about dyads. First, uh, we'll talk about force connections a bit more in the Knights of the Old Republic episode, because it's important in that game and also in one of those games. And also you will eventually see a uh, true force dyad form later in the timeline. Um, Bob, if you could form a force dyad with any Star Wars character, who would it be? Um, Possibly Yoda. He's just such a such a cool little guy. I've always really liked uh, his his philosophies and just how kind and wise uh, he's often been portrayed as. Yeah, OK. Now I feel like any other answer is wrong. That's actually a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to say something like maybe Obi-Wan or. Maybe oh, who someone with like a cool ability, like uh, we'll talk about. Um, I always want to call her Sinestra from the High Republic. Vernestra? Like Vernestra. What's her? She hates to be called Vern, so don't pull a Jim Varney and call her Vern. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, Bane's idea about this, you know, rule of two is that it's other than you know, trying to form this dyad. He also just he wants to consolidate power. He wants to keep it simple, cleaner. And, and the grand plan is to destroy the Republican Jedi from within at letting the strongest, i.e. the Sith Master, take power. In reality, a lot of Sith Lords, including Bane and Legends, uh, take a second backup apprentice. And so they're kind of like hedging their bets, pitting their apprentices against each other. That's something we see pop up a lot. Definitely do. Yeah. And uh, I, Darth Bane's apprentice, Darth Zana, by the way, has also been confirmed in canon now. Uh, but it just basically her existence is confirmed in canon. So I'm really hoping that they're going to show more of her story, uh, her story, because I think she's she's a really cool figure with a complex morality. And she's like a kind of a bit more witchy, which is my vibe. 
That's always been my vibe with her, too. Uh, yeah, she's always been a favorite character since I had a friend read about her from actual comics before we even got the Darth Bane trilogy. Uh, oh, I yeah. didn't even know she was in comics before that. OK, cool. Yeah. I have to look that up. Yeah. So hoping we see her as more than a reference in canon soon. Um, but of course, she is ultimately as Bane's apprentice. She is the one who kills him on Korriban, the Sith planet. And so that's where he's buried, the last buried there. At this point, when she kills Bane, the Jedi don't realize that she's a Sith because, you know, they think she's she's killed her enemy, not that she's killed her master. Um, so from the galactic and Jedi perspective, the Sith have been defeated and they construct the new Jedi temple on top of the old Sith temple in Coruscant. And after thousands of years of war, there's peace in the galaxy. And little do they know that the Sith are using this rule of two to just keep on existing past this point, stealthily, hidden in plain sight. But don't you think, so we talked about the Jedi scourging uh, Mandalore and also knocking out the Sith. Isn't that kind of a double genocide? I mean, I know like the Mandalorians, they survive in their domes and Bane's the one who finished off the Sith, but the Jedi are, kind of looking like the baddies a little bit too no i i think you're absolutely right yes <laughs> i think yeah they on the surface i think they are the definition of meaning well but sure. sometimes doing the wrong things for the right reason or yeah or maybe it's not the wrong thing because this defeat leads to a period of healing and growth which uh mm -hmm. eventually leads to the high republic which is the next era we'll be talking about uh, we're not done here. We're going to take a little break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about the Old Republic of Legends and more characters and ideas we think or hope could turn up in canon. Okay, and we're back. So we're going to talk through some of some highlights from the Old Republic and Legends and uh, some important figures that we hope might be pulled over. Some of them have been referenced. We'll tell you which, but that doesn't mean that every part of the Legends story is true. Um, starting with Darth Revan is an important figure from Legends who's been referenced in canon, but actually we're going to mostly skip past him right now because Marchin and I will be covering his story in full when we talk about the Knights of the Old Republic games next episode. But Bob, do you know much about Revan? Do you have any thoughts about him? He's actually a very interesting character to me, and uh, I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about him. I feel like I've watched uh more than one friend play um knights, the of, the Re Republic. Not, knights of the old republic yeah um at least twice but there's still so much i feel i've yet to uh, learn about this character um i recently got his action figure reviewed that on uh, on the channel a few months back and i really love the look of him yeah he looks like a badass as you would he expect he really does yeah and i like that he wears a mask it's, uh, yeah, I think that adds to the mystery. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll talk about this in the next episode. But one interesting thing about him in the game is that you can play as any character. So I've heard people say that they wish they had because ultimately he takes off his mask and we, you know, he identifies himself and his gender and who he is. And he has a story that goes on past that. But a lot of people think, wouldn't it be cool if he just stayed this kind of faceless figure that everyone can put themselves in the in the seat of. Yeah. And also uh, another figure linked to him is uh, Darth Nihilus. So I just think that he's an interesting character. Before becoming a Sith Lord, he lost everything during the Galactic Republic's war against the Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders. And um, so he survived the Scourge on Malachor shadow that obliterated almost everything on and around the planet and made Nihilus crave force energy. So this is a theme that we see coming back again and again, that the Sith just can't get enough. They're just a bottomless pits of craving more energy, and that can have a uh, 
that can have, yeah, they can basically be like the black hole for the force. Mm -hmm. Especially in Legends. And another interesting concept is the Zell Tong War for Coruscant. So some in Legends, I think it's confirmed that the Zell are the first humans. It's not confirmed in canon uh, that they're like sort of proto-humans. Um, but they, it is ex confirmed that the Zell existed on Coruscant in canon. The Tong, the species they fight against in Legends, is not confirmed in canon, but they look really badass. They almost like their bodies almost look like exposed muscle. And then they have like crowns of tentacles on their heads. And um, they end up retreating to a planet in the outer rim because obviously I told you the Zells are the humans they won. Um, but so the Tong retreat to this planet in the outer rim and they meet Mandalore there and end up following him into the conquest of Mandalore. So they're some of the founding Mandalorians in the end. I wonder if they got a day named after them in canon. I, I Right now in my VS level head canon, they may have lost the war, but maybe the Tongs got a, a day named after them. I know we've heard the uh, the phrase Tongs days, am I right? In, uh, you know, yeah, I no, that's... that's what... <laughs> it's true, isn't that? It's not in canon. The Zells definitely have a day named after them in canon. Yeah, so we have, let's see, Coruscant has five days. Is okay, just pause the podcast to, to look this up because this is important. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's true. So there are five days in the week there's Prime Day, Sentax Day, Tongs Day, Zell Day and Bendu Day. So we've already identified the sources of three of them. So I guess that means Tong's confirmed canon, right? Right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know how this works. Tell me, Filoni. <laughs> um, we also mentioned the Rakata invaders last time. They're an important group in canon. Uh, sorry, they're an important group in Legends, not confirmed yet in canon. Um, but yeah, they were basically, they were warring it up at this point in the Legends timeline. Uh, listen again to the Dawn of the Jedi episode for a little more information about who they were fighting with. And another concept that I'm curious about is... Um, I don't know if this came across, because this might be from the comics, the... well. Or maybe actually, no, it's in the later books, isn't it? The Lost Tribe of the Sith? Yeah, which I still wish they would put on audio. Um, that's mostly yeah. in print, so I've just kind of heard about them. I, I would love to experience their actual story. Yeah. Are they So these were Sith who were shipwrecked before the Sith were destroyed. These Sith were shipwrecked on a remote planet around uh, 5,000 BBY in Legends. Uh, so this is actually around the time of the Knights of the Old Republic games, which I'm going to call KOTOR from now on, because that's what people call it. And it's fewer syllables to say. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so these Lost Tribe of the Sith, they returned later in the timeline. And I'm wondering if similar could have happened in canon, because it's a really convenient and interesting storytelling device, to be honest. <laughs> And I have to bring up one more um, because <laughs> Bob, I mentioned it to you and it made you laugh. This is not an important person, but it has to be mentioned. Darth Millennial. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most emo of the Sith. Um, he was a three eyed mutant Sith Lord who followed in the footsteps of Bane. So he was one of, you know, his uh, someone in his line. And he lived around 1000 BBY. So. Yeah, this is the kind of like random weird stuff they probably won't bring over from canon. But I wonder who, how much that person was smoking when they named him Darth Millennial. I have no idea. For some reason, I just hear Napoleon Dynamite's voice in my head whenever I imagine this guy talking. I don't know why that is, but I do. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> And I have to give a recommendation to that was just given to me this week for anyone who's interested in, in more details from these Legends book. There's a Legends Lounge podcast, which not affiliated with uh, uh, me and the Lorehounds or anything, but uh, I was turned on to them this, this past week and I've been kind of binging them since. It's, they cover a lot of the biggest legend series like i i'm i assume the point is to cover them all but they have covered for instance the darth bane trilogy and a lot of other ones um and yeah just a really interesting way to catch up on the books and see which ones might interest you if you're interested in reading more bob i definitely think you would like that podcast 
Oh, yeah. Um, I'm actually going back. And now, since they have unabridged uh, audiobooks, because I was able to experience most of Legends, uh, sadly, in its abridged form uh, back right. in the 90s. So, so I, my, I was getting huge chunks of the books just edited out. And now that um, National Library Service for the Blind and, and the actual mainstream audio market have come in, it's been a joy to listen to what I call the extended versions of uh, of the books. Of course, you guys have always been able to experience them in their entirety, but uh, it's wonderful hey. actually being able to see these, you know, the way that they were meant to be experienced. Yeah, but I think also not just visually impaired people, but I know a lot more people who are reading more because because of audiobooks, because audiobooks are becoming more prevalent, they're becoming more interesting, better production values. And this is making people more interested in experiencing, you know, these verbal stories. Mm -hmm. That's been, I'm glad to see that. That is a, as, as someone, <laughs> as a, you know, journalist and translator whose, whose work has often been ravaged by uh, technology and changes in technology. Um, there are some that are really toward the greater good. Definitely. So, Bob, do you have any other favorites that you hope make it into the main timeline? Someone I'd love to see uh, in terms of maybe live action animation, you know, even if it is a cameo, is uh, is Exar Kun. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we've briefly covered him uh, right. on, the, on the podcast, but um, he was in uh the audio comic adaptation of dark lords of the sith uh from legends mm. he's he's in the actual comics of course uh, he plays a big role later on in kevin j anderson's jedi academy trilogy um there are a few adaptations on youtube that uh, someone has uploaded they're from the 90s and one of my favorite voice actors who voiced uh master splinter in the original tmnt show oh. peter Peter Rinaday, uh, he does the voice of Exar Kun in uh, the full cast audio drama, and he's just amazing. I love that guy. He does such a great Sith. <laughs> what makes a great Sith voice? He, I don't know how Peter went about portraying him. He just sounded so commanding and fearsome, very warlike. And uh, Exar Kun was, was well into war quite a bit so i think peter just really nailed the uh, the character when he uh, brought him to life and and i think only a way that peter in today could um they did tales of the jedi and dark lord to the sith but sadly they never finished off the uh, the adaptations with the sith war so i've only gotten to read what happens on wikipedia it's just then this happened then this other thing happened then uh, everybody yeah. went home <laughs> i was like oh come on <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, maybe, maybe, um, I, I hope that that's covered on the, the Legends Lounge because that's actually, I've been super enjoying that podcast, uh, since I picked it up. Um, what would Darth Deadeye Sith Eye Bob sound like? Hmm. Perhaps a bit like this. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. No, I, I see I'm terrible <laughs> doing voices. This is a skill you have that I do not. <laughs> uh, uh, I just do it for funsies while I'm cleaning and stuff. When I was a kid, I used to uh, do it while playing with action figures with my brother. So we'd entertain ourselves for hours. <laughs> Yeah, no, but exactly. I can hear the perfect impression in my head. Like sometimes when I'm trying to do an, a certain accent, like I can hear, like, oh, do a French accent. And I call up the voices of my French friends and I hear them perfectly in my head, but my mouth does not form that way. It does not. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm terrible at uh, mimicking in that way. And you seem to have yeah, a special talent for it. I think I based him on Freedon Nad from those uh, Tales of the Jedi audio comics. I think um, he's got another really memorable voice. And I just loved it whenever he would talk to Exar Kun and he was like, you will be one of the great ones. He just had such a great uh, raspy kind of voice. Not not as much as Palpatine, but uh, right. just a really fantastic character to listen to in the uh, the full cast audio dramas from the 90s. Yeah, yeah, Sith, gotta have that rasp. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you decide to become a Sith, you have to start smoking 10 packs a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, we teased a little bit that there are more non-Jedi and non-Sith Force users. So, you know, there are different ways to, because the Force is, it's, you know, it's like the air. It's just flowing all around you and it's up to you whether and how you want to build a windmill to harness its power. So first of all, I just want to make a couple vocab distinctions we might use in this podcast is that dark Jedi are not quite the same as the Sith. A lot of Sith were dark Jedi, which is basically you could call like fallen Jedi, you know, just Jedi that uh, started playing with the dark side a little too much. But that's different than becoming an actual Sith is is a different as a whole nother step. And you might also hear us talk about gray Jedi. And this is not a canon term, but it's a term that a lot of people find useful. Uh, And it's just basically like I was talking about earlier, that gray morality. So they're not, you know, they don't adhere to either dogma. They're just kind of trying to find their own way in the middle. Mm -hmm. I think gray Jedi are my favorite. Yeah, I need to uh, read up on on more of that concept. I've I've, you know, read bits and pieces here and there. And nowadays people are like, well, so-and-so is actually a gray Jedi. And then someone else argues and they're like, well, no, this guy over here, he's actually one. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, I I need to. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not an official concept, um, but it's but I find it a useful way of thinking because I like to think about, you know, great characters there. And we'll definitely I'll point out who I think are gray Jedi as we talk through all of the. All of this story, so much story. And also another group with questionable morality we'll be talking about are the Night Sisters. Uh, we will mention them a lot more as we go. We mention them in the Dawn of the Jedi overview, but they're basically a group of dark side force users. They're often called force witches who we recently learned from a show later in the timeline. They actually came millennia earlier to the this galaxy from another galaxy called Peridia. And I don't know, I wouldn't rule out them showing up in the Acolyte. Um, We do see in the trailer what seem to be some sort of force witches, but they look very different in terms of the way they're dressed. And they don't have that Night Sisters have that distinctive uh, gray skin with black markings. And and these force witches, they just completely styled differently. Uh, But we also recently saw... uh, that on Dathomir, the planet of the Night Sisters, there are other groups as well. And this was true in Legends, and now it's been confirmed in canon. Uh, for example, one called the Mountain Clan. And mm-hmm. the Mountain Clan also completely styled differently. Lo- they look kind of like medieval nun types, but um, they are light side users. So that was, yeah, I'm very curious to see what more Force Witches will show up in the Acolytes. I guess you you also like the witchy types, don't you, Bob? Yes, I do. Um, I've really had a fondness for the Night Sisters since first reading about them in uh, the courtship of Princess Leia years and years and years ago. <laughs> yes, that is a Legends novel in which they first show up, and then they were brought over into canon by you know Dave Filoni, who we mentioned earlier, because he likes it weird, so I like him. <laughs> Another interesting thing about the Night Sisters that uh, I really loved was one of my friends had shown me one of the Ewok movies. And I mean, they're not canon or anything, but uh, there was a witch in that. And when she started doing her thing, I remember looking over at him and getting all excited and thinking to myself, that's got to be a Night Sister. She's she's got to be a Night Sister. And he was like, what the heck's a Night Sister? And I'm like, oh, man, I got to I got to introduce you to some of the books. <laughs> Oh, man, I need to go back and watch it. When I was a kid, I loved the Ewoks. You'll, those of you who don't know, you'll meet the Ewoks in the original trilogy era. era. Um, they're little, like, teddy bear-type creatures. They're ad- adorable little meat eaters. <laughs> but, yeah, they had, like, a whole TV show in the 80s. It's no longer. It's now definitely Legends. And I used to watch it at the time, but I haven't seen it since, so I don't remember much about it. I have never seen movies, any too. of them. Yeah, Battle for Endor, I think, was the one that I'm thinking of that featured um, a okay. character who was later confirmed to be a Night Sister in uh, in Legends, anyway. So he made the okay. movie for me. I was like, Ewoks are cool, but boy, I love this uh, creepy Force witch. 
Yeah, when we get to that point in the timeline, I definitely got to rewatch that stuff that I used to watch as a kid, even though it's still Legends. It's, uh, yeah, we don't get much Ewoks because people decided they weren't cool and they're wrong. <laughs> they are very cool. They eat people. <laughs> I know. All right. But anyway, that's that comes millennia later. <laughs> Adorable little uh, meat eaters. Um, yeah. <laughs> But back in the ancient times, we there was another group called the Shapers of Crovar, and we just basically know about this from a Wizards of the Coast Jedi Academy training manual. Uh, this is in Legends, but it's just another example of Force users who are not Jedi or Sith, but they claim to be similar in tradition to the Night Sisters. And we also had on the dark side the Sorcerers of Rand, R H A N D, and they. They didn't acknowledge the Force. They said they worshipped the Dark, with a capital D. And their concept, they just basically wanted to end the entire universe. They are the Nihilists, not to be confused with Darth Nihilists. <laughs> <laughs> and um, on the light side, we've got, for example, the Baron Dosages. So these are now canon, this group of precognitives from the planet of Doran. Uh, so they are... Keldor uh, is their species. So this is like a character you'll meet in the prequel trilogy era called Plo Kloon. But the Barandor sages were, this is again, the Jedi being questionable. The Jedi would come and take their strongest force users to train them as Jedi and that weakened the sages. So the Jedi are kind of weakening the other force users around them because they're competition for the best talent. And uh, yeah, we also have the Daigoyan Masters. They were a group that were strong in the Force, but um, they were not warriors. They focused on knowledge, intuition, and the harmony of the universe. So these are some people that I want to be able to to hang out with. They're pacifists, and uh, we'll see them in the Clone Wars. Um, and we'll also see even more soon, we're going to talk a bit in the... High Republic Overview episode and then see them again later about a group called the Church of the Force and also the Guardians of the Wills. This group, a lot of people will especially know a certain badass blind Force monk character that we meet later in the timeline. Oh, yeah. These groups also are exist in the High Republic. And um, yeah, we're just going to keep bringing up more such orders as we work through history, because as we said, both Bob and I find them interesting. I think others do, too. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are also plenty of non-Force users who have wielded lightsabers, like Grievous is a character we'll meet later. And uh, we talked about the Mandalorians who have the Darksaber, the, um, the Vizsla clan. And apparently it's just if you try to wield a lightsaber and you're not strong in the Force, it's the weapon feels heavier and it, you have to be more careful because you don't have the extra senses attuned to help you avoid hurting yourselves with this, you know, laser blade, this unprotected laser blade. But, you know, there are a lot of people, the ones we've talked about, none of them are trying to be Jedi. Uh, but there are those who are weak in the force and do try to become Jedi or try to do something uh, with the force. And... Few of them actually end up as actual Jedi. Um, there was a, in earlier times around there were the Jedi Services Corps it was there to sweep up younglings and Padawans who didn't pass their tests and put them to humanitarian work and soldiering later on during the Clone Wars. So we know um, that th there are reference books that have this is legends. It's become canon now as well. So. Basically, most non-Force sensitives got to be aides to the Jedi. And for the Sith, it was even worse, especially the Sith race. If you were a Sith and you could not wield the Force, then you were just like the lowest of low. Do you have anything to add, Bob? I think you've covered it very well. Well, we'll keep bringing this stuff back up as we go. Um, any last thoughts? Um, I think uh, it's just such a fascinating time period, and I hope that we get to see more of it in animation, live action, uh, hopefully books, and hey, maybe eventually uh, audio comic adaptations, which I wish there would be more of. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, yeah. They, I mean, it would be cool if they did more of that in general. Mm-hmm. I, I've been myself just appreciating more audio form of stuff just because I can do it while I'm cleaning, listen to it while I'm cleaning, you know, while I'm biking, while I'm doing other stuff. Okay, that's a wrap then on the Old Republic Overview. And next time, Marchin and I will take a deeper dive into the Knights of the Old Republic Games and the Old Republic MMO, a semi-gray area that's like canon adjacent, but still definitely Legends. And then after that, Bob and I will be back with an overview of the current High Republic canon with special attention to characters or concepts that will likely be important for the Acolyte series. Now, for now, we're just going to keep this to an overview of the High Republic era and keep it light on the book spoilers, because yeah, once the books are finished and more people have had time to catch up, then we're going to uh, jump back and look at that in a bit more depth. Um, I definitely suspect the High Rep- the Acolyte's going to trigger more people to want to read these High Republic series of books. Oh, I think so. Very much. Yeah, so we'll definitely jump back before season two of The Acolyte, which no, I don't have any knowledge of confirmation of there being a season two, but I know showrunners want that to happen, and I don't see why it wouldn't. Fingers yeah, crossed. I feel the same way. And then finally, we're going to wrap up the um, the Acolyte prep series with a talk about season one of Young Jedi Adventures. So that's it's a it's a cute little show for preschoolers. Uh, so we're gonna, just going to talk about the whole season at once. But um, yeah, there's some things worth mentioning. And it's a fun little chat to have. And uh, if you haven't watched it, then we'll tell you what you need to know. So thank you again to Jedi Jedi Bob for co-hosting with me. Uh, check out his YouTube channel, which you'll find in the show notes. And uh, you can also find us both on Twitter. Those links in the show notes as well. This episode was produced by me, published by the Lorehounds. On the Lorehounds parent feed, you'll find the Bad Batch finale and uh, Tales of the Empire episode. Uh, this, these are titles that we're going to cover on this podcast, starting once we reach the Fifth Era. And also, there'll be on the Lorehounds feed, Doctor Who coverage, X-Men 97, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. These are just episodes that I'll appear in that I'm naming, but... Um, the guys are also busy, especially right now with recapping, uh, house of the dragon season one to get ready for season two. And they've created a whole in-depth show guide. So definitely go over there, check it out, join us on discord to chat about all this stuff. And also check out the other Lorehounds affiliates, including radioactive ramblings, which has, uh, finished up their coverage of fallouts and is now covering season two of invincible. Uh, Rings in Rituals, where two Tolkien scholars are recapping season one of uh, Rings of Power, but with a deeper look at the rituals in both Tolkien's world and our own. So you learn a lot about the Tolkien universe through this podcast. And properly, Howard, uh, funny off-color movie reviews. Uh, they're currently doing a season-themed felonies and fugazis. So you can get catch their reviews and things like both Point Break and uh, Gross Point Blank and a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, you'll find a, the Lorehounds link in the show notes and there you'll find links to all of these podcasts where you can subscribe on your platform of choice. Uh, for those of you listening live, we'll see you in a few days to talk about the Old Republic games. Bye. Bye.